Hello, and welcome to the Homeschooling and Loving It podcast. I'm your host, Jamie, your friend at homeschool.com and homeschool mom of six. Join us as we keep it real and chat about the ups and downs of this amazing adventure we call the homeschool life. So grab a cup of your warm favorite and a comfy chair and let's get started. Hello everyone, I'm Jamie with homeschool.com and I want to welcome you to our homeschooling and loving it series. During this series, we'll be chatting with experienced homeschool parents and other experts on a variety of homeschooling and parenting topics. And we are doing this so that you, our listeners, our fellow homeschoolers can see that it is possible to homeschool and love it. We also want you to know that homeschool.com exists to help you with free tools, resources, and helpful tips to homeschool. And so for those of you who've been homeschooling a long time, you probably have some curriculum and textbook favorites. Some of you might have enjoyed certain things so much, certain authors, certain texts so much that they sort of become heroes for you. We are interviewing someone who is pretty much that for us. We used the mystery of history textbook when our children were younger so that we could do history all together. And this, the author of this book is, has agreed to join us today for an interview. And so we're super thrilled. Um, so glad that you could join us, Linda. Thank you, Jamie. It's an honor to be here. And I just wish our listeners knew that this wasn't easy either. We've had all sorts of issues trying to get together. So let's do this. Linda Hobar, I'm hoping, did I say that right? Yes. Hobar, okay. The Mystery of History series is a project she worked on for how many years did it take you to write all of it? 17. And then a couple of more after that to get some second edition. So we're now all four in hardback. So almost 20 years. Wow, definitely a labor of love. And so she's going to talk to us today about what the mystery of history is and why history matters. And so I'm looking forward to that. And let me give you some background on Linda before we get into the nitty gritty of our topic. So Linda was a native born Texan and she's now living in Tennessee. And Linda holds a bachelor's degree, bachelor of arts degree from Baylor University. Of course, that is one of the most well-known Texas universities. And it's there that she fell in love with world history and through homeschooling her own children and through uh, service as a missionary, she discovered a deep love for world history and that whole idea of where the famous and the infamous have left their mark in time. And so in the year 2000, she sensed that call to write the mystery of history for her children, grandchildren, and for all of us. So that we might be able to know the mystery of God in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Colossians 2, 3. So obviously our topic today is going to be about history. And um, we've had a lot of new homeschool families that feel frustrated uh, with teaching certain subjects, maybe teaching multiple children. Some feel they can't make this topic interesting. Maybe they're, they just feel stuck. I think that's another question that I've had a lot of recently. How can we make this exciting? Um, And some even wonder if it's really important to spend a lot of time on history. So Linda, can you start by helping us understand why history matters? Absolutely. Well, (laughs) I think it's rather clear if you turn on the news today, we are reminded how relevant history is. It is always embedded in our headlines. Do you know what I'm saying? Like events that happened back in the 1500s, that's why we see some things. Can I give you one quick example? We'll dive right into a history story. So like, for example, I wrote a history lesson about Ismael I, who in the 1500s decided that Iran would be a Shiite nation. Well. It's for that reason that the Sunni nations that surround Iran aren't exactly on the same page. I think most of our listeners know that Islam is sorely divided between Shiites and Sunnis. All to say that a decision made by one man in the 1500s would influence our headlines even today. So that's just a quick example. So why history matters. It is just everywhere. And as the old adage goes, you know, he who... Uh, neglects history is destined to repeat it and isn't that true 
we see man go through these cycles. And I will say the the cycles to some degree are encouraging because we do see man go high and low and high and low rating riding these waves, but it's not as if God's not in control of all of it because he really is. I, I want to say this too. There are so many parents who will say to me that they don't feel adequate to teach history. So first I want everyone to know they're not alone. I think most of us feel that way because we bring to the table our own experience with history, which for most of us was very chopped up. If we did get history, few of us got it in chronological order, where for example, we could see the cause and effect. Another example, you ready? Um, <laughs> the fall of the Roman Empire ushers in the Middle Ages. The Reformation will really influence American history. So anyway, the good news is you do not have to know history to teach history. You can actually sit down and learn it with your students. You can read, you can listen. We have audio books. And um, anyway, I'm jumping ahead here. You're excited about the topic and that's, that's lovely. So I do appreciate what you said. And I, when I started teaching my children and used this chronological approach where I saw both Christian history, biblical history, aligning with secular history and, and things that I never connected before, like certain things happening at, around the same time. It really connected dots for me that I never understood before. Um, but what would you say for those who think history is boring? What encouragement would you give to them to help them as they teach it? Well, first I'm with you. I grew up on those dull, dry, horrible history textbooks that really squelched what it was all about. So I think one of the main things that helps make history interesting and not boring is to really keep the stories about the people. It's not events that are interesting. It's the people. It's their human nature. It's learning from their mistakes and their successes. I do have a favorite example to give you. So you ready? One of my favorite examples is that of Cleopatra. Now I have this weird quirky habit, Jamie, when I go to like a garage sale or an estate sale and I find an old history book, well, this is what I'll do. I'll pick it up and I'll look for Cleopatra in the index just for fun. She's like my person. I always look up Cleopatra. That's how I judge a book. And do you know, nine out of 10 times, I'm going to find one paragraph about Cleopatra in the average history textbook because they go from like ancient times all the way to modern. That's another story. They're putting too much in a book. So, and in those handful of sentences, you're going to hear or read that she's like the last of the Ptolemies. Well, I don't know about you, but that is not enough to interest me whatsoever. For one, it's, it's actually hard to pronounce Ptolemy. It starts with a P, so I'm already thrown off there. But like, if you want to tell me instead that she rolled up in a carpet for her first meeting with Julius Caesar so that they could take over the known world, then if you want to tell me that she hooks up with Julius Caesar, this powerful Roman, and then he's assassinated on the windy Ides of March for trying to take too much control over the people, which is relevant. It was government overreach. So, and then if you want to tell me that after that, she hooks up with Mark Antony and there's a love story, they marry, and then they, they are up against Octavian in the battle of Actium out on the Mediterranean sea. And in the sea battle, uh, Mark Antony chases Cleopatra back to Egypt and Octavian comes after them all to say to, to the point where Cleopatra will take her life because Mark Antony dies. It's this incredibly juicy story, but, but there's one more layer to it. You ready? After all this, if, if, as if that's not interesting enough, instead of just saying she's the last of the Ptolemies, um, here's this Octavian, after he defeats Cleopatra and Mark Antony, he will rename himself Caesar Augustus, and he will issue a decree that all should be taxed, which is exactly why Mary and Joseph would go to Bethlehem. It's like, what? Yes, that story, the very Christmas story is going to spin right out of this, this complex story of Cleopatra. So don't tell me history is boring. Keep it about the people. Find these stories throughout that have such meaning. And I, I promise it will help. <laughs> that brings me to another aspect of your history series. We loved that idea of how it connected the dots. I think I mentioned that already and how it let us see the biblical history and how it connects to these different things, as you just mentioned. Can you give us anything more about the way that you have set up the mystery of history series and how it differs with the traditional way that history mm -hmm. is usually taught? 
I can think of two examples. For one, I felt it very important when, when I was writing about ancient times that I wanted students to know the minor and the major prophets and to learn about them from a biography standpoint, to learn that they were real men and women who had messages straight from God. So actually the major minor prophets all have chapters in the mystery of history, a book of ancient times, so that we can see those prophets in a historical context. I think that gives great credibility and validity to the Bible and also helps students see that those funny names at the end of their Old Testament, those aren't just random. Do you know what I'm saying? There's real historical significance to them. So that's one thing. But another one I just have to talk about would be the story of the Assyrians and the Israelites. That is something we really ought to hone in on just as Christians to help us again find this credibility of the Bible. And one reason is that, okay, you know, there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. They divided in Israel. Well, it was the northern kingdom that was attacked by the Assyrians and they were literally deported. Okay, you've heard of that story possibly. Bible teachers love to call it the the story of the lost tribes of Israel. Well, um, by the way, they were never fully lost. That is just a nickname. God doesn't call them lost. But we do know that the northern kingdom is conquered by the Assyrians. We would say that's a Bible story. Well, it goes further because Sargon, one of several Assyrian kings, he would be so proud that he would boast and chisel on, his, on the walls of his palace that he deported the Israelites. Mm -hmm. Well, friends, that's extra biblical information. I mean, I'm, I'm so thankful he was bold enough and and boastful enough to inscribe that on the walls of a palace that we can still get to today. So extra biblical information. So when we put secular and Bible history together, it's it's so revealing. Can, can I give you another story? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, <laughs> turning into a history lesson here. Oh my, but anyway, it. so another <laughs> favorite story would be that of the Battle of Marathon. You know, most people have heard of a marathon, right? People still run marathons because of the distance between Athens and the Plain of Marathon, where a man ran to tell, rejoice, you know, we conquered. Well, the thing is, the defeat of Darius, who was a Persian king, he was defeated by the Greeks in the Battle of Marathon. But there's a little bit more to that story. Darius had a son that wanted to avenge his father's loss at the Battle of Marathon. And that son was named Xerxes. So he's another powerful Persian. By the way, Persia would be the uh, nation of Iran today. Now, Xerxes is defeated too. But lo and behold, this same Xerxes had a wife named Vashti that was banished from his kingdom. So he hosts a beauty pageant to replace her. And I think you know the rest of the story. He picks Esther. She's born a Jewish girl for such a time as this to help save her people from a decree of destruction. So, whoa, I love that students could first learn about Darius in this historical context to learn that he's a real Persian king. He attempts to conquer the Greeks, but is defeated. And then he has a son. And then to learn that that son is Esther's husband. We call him Ahasuerus in the Bible story. I think that that helps make Esther seem so much less of just a rags to riches Bible story. She was a real queen who was quite brave. She married a very powerful man, the head of Persia. So mm, we see God's sovereignty in that story. I think again, the story of Darius, which none debate happened, helps support the biblical story of Esther. Can you explain what makes a biblical worldview critical to understanding history accurately? Because, I mean, we've talked about the, you know, the connection and, and what you, you know, the examples you just gave us. But how is that important? Well, one of many things that comes to my mind would be the nature of mankind. You see, the Bible explains our fallenness. The world doesn't period. The world doesn't explain sin very well without a concept of God, where Romans 3.23 will tell us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So man can't fix himself. But I tell you what, when we look into history, we see man trying all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Man tries through the age of reason. Like surely if we were just more reasonable, man will fix his problems or let's be more enlightened. There's a whole period of the enlightenment where man just thought he could do a better job and be less barbaric, which by the way, it's not that man isn't innovative. He is, he invents better things all the time, but his heart doesn't change. 
So even today, we have Marxism drifting all over the world as we speak, and it's built on the false premise that man can correct himself. That's really what Karl Marx believed. As an atheist, he has this framework that man just had to fix and correct himself. There's a lot of um, George Hegel ideas in there. And so he believed he could create utopia on earth. In his mind, the whole problem was economic. So he thought he could eliminate the upper class and then the lower class could take over and find world peace. Well, there's just great problems with that. Yes, he identified that man struggles with greed. He does. But greed comes from the fall, not from the accumulation of mere material wealth or the lack of it. So man and his problems were we're not going to solve it by class warfare, which is what Marx proposed. Very good point. Okay, let's get to the nitty gritty. So those for those of our homeschool uh, community who aren't familiar with your series, I know I kind of flashed what I had. And this is old, as you mentioned, this is now hardback and updated. Yes. But this is the one, this is our loved book from when my children were younger. I had six children and we would use this kind of, it's it's lovely because uh, there's so much biblical truth in it that we would kind of cross it over to sort of a family devotion time and history all rolled up into one. But tell us about uh, your series and what exactly is the mystery of history? Sure. Well, in a nutshell, it is a four volume program. So there are four volumes and our taglines are that it is chronological. So we start with ancient times. We go ancient, medieval, Renaissance, modern. Those are the fault four. And it is Christian because I teach from a biblical worldview. And then it's complete because we do give you a full world history experience. We're not just looking at Western civilization. We do pull in the Eastern hemisphere. Now, um, about those four eras, uh, they are important, I think, for us to grasp uh, that it's just an easier way to kind of chunk out history. Mm -hmm. And I always encourage people, focus on one time period at a time. Remember when we were talking about trying to make history more interesting? Mm -hmm. Well, again, if you spend a whole year in ancient times, it'll be far more interesting than if you just take the average history book Mm -hmm. that puts all the history of the world into one volume. That, that's when we wind up with a lot of dates, events, and treaties, and less about the people. So it is important to focus in on those four. Um, so let's see, what else do I need to tell you? They are now all four hardback. And this is something important to know is that now that we're in hardback, so when our uh, readers open their textbook, which is now in color, it's beautiful. When they open it, there's a code inside the book, and that code leads you to a 500-page companion guide, which is not really a workbook, but it's just a resource stuffed with all sorts of things you can do with your family. It's full of retention tools. There's pre-tests and hands-on activities. There's ways to make timeline figures. There's mapping exercises. There's quizzes and tests and a extensive literature list. So we pack a lot into there. Well, I liked the fact that I could use it with many children. So that is a big question I get from a lot of homeschool moms who are seeking help. Like, I've, I've got five kids. How can I simplify my life? Well, first thing I usually tell them is to try to teach Bible, history, science with all of them together at once. So I know your curriculum does well with this, which is why I chose it when I was younger. So can you dig into that a little bit? And I'd love to elaborate. And this is something that I'm sure the veterans have recognized if they've called it this or not, but this is something good for new people to know is generally speaking, there's two types of subjects. So one group of subjects are our stair step subjects. Those are the subjects that really require mastery on one level to advance to the next level. Clearly math is a concrete stair step subject, right? You really have to learn how to add and subtract before you can multiply and divide. And grammar would also fit under that, foreign languages. Lots of our subjects are concrete. The schools are pretty good at pumping those out. 
But there are a host of other subjects that I would call living subjects that do not necessarily require mastery at one level to keep going. And world history is a living subject. Some of the earth sciences, I'd say Bible falls under that. And of course, I adore these subjects. I'm a free spirit, so I like them because you can just, they're endless, they're bottomless. A, a good example of that would be the Trojan War. Okay, let's take the Trojan War. Uh, you know, a four-year-old can sit and hear that story and be absolutely enraptured because there's a horse in it. You know, all the men get in the horse and they're driven into the gates of the city and then they get out. So there's just a fantastic story there. I think an 11 year old can love the story because they might go further with it. They're going to understand Helen, how she gets like captured and crosses the sea. And then an 84 year old can love the story and, and take it to a, di a different level. So no matter your age, no matter your interests, you can zoom in and zoom out of these living subjects constantly. And maybe you really want to become an expert of one area. And it's funny, I met a man once who was what I would call an expert on the Civil War. And he looked at me one time and he's like, I know this much of it. I'm like, but that's all you do is study that one thing. But what he meant is that you can't know all history. Because even as him being a Civil War expert, here he is knowing one story on one edge of one battle, but there's all the other perspectives of all the other people that are involved. So, so this is part of what makes history so endless. All to say, I hope as a homeschool family, you recognize when you need to farm them out, and there are some subjects you really need to do that for. And hopefully once they're reading and can do some independent work, you can work with the little ones that still need more of your involvement. But by all means, when you're hitting living subjects, pull the family together. It's so much less wear and tear on the mom or the dad who's teaching because you can streamline, everyone can enjoy a subject. Uh, like a like a history story together and um, then you wind up kind of growing together too because you're all on that medieval feast or you're all on that lesson about Australia and talking it or whatever it is so yes I, I personally really enjoy those living subjects absolutely and I think one of the things that I got so excited about because I'm hands-on uh, I love dabbling in art and painting and drawing were kind of the extension activities that we could do with some of the lessons where we would maybe make a clay pot or i remember um, when the kids and i were studying the history of the revolutionary war period in america we made beeswax candles together <laughs> you know just mm -hmm. little things or corn husk dolls we did that as well so little fun things and then um, at the end of units we would have like a meal that align the things yes mm -hmm. with the history study so those are ways that i would encourage parents to kind of add in some fun activities even with whatever you're studying and you know another thing my teenagers ended up liking was watching those movies that we've kind of alluded to here and there um and like you said the older movies usually do a much better job of sticking closer to the history i really appreciate all of that it's, it's wonderful so if our homeschool listeners would like to know how to find your series where would you want them mm -hmm. to go? we would love for you to visit our website we are vendors as well as authors and so we sell our own materials we also have a publisher bright ideas press but our website is the mystery of history.com and just to uh, circle back to those activities you're talking about you know we give you those by age group in the mystery of history so we've done some of the thinking for you so if you feel a little dry on your ideas after every single lesson in our series, we give you an activity for younger, middle, and older students. And the younger obviously are far more hands-on using their senses. The older ones are a bit more research-oriented. And one of the beautiful things is that some older students, maybe they're not ready for research and reports, but they can still drop down and do hands-on work if that matches their learning style. So you're not fixed into a rigid differentiation between those age groups but I give you basically it's, you know, all those learning styles are there. Right. But yeah, you can reach us through the mystery of history.com. And can I announce something brand new I have going on? Yes, please. Okay. Just as of, let's see, what's today? Is today Thursday? It is Thursday. 
<laughs> well, to, as of today, I've just launched my own podcast. I've started one called The Mystery of Home Education, just again to support people in their journey. Having been a homeschool parent for 20 plus years, I feel like I got a few things to say just about that side of it. So you can also uh, get to that through our website of The Mystery of History. Okay, wonderful. So as we wrap up our little interview session today, can you just take a minute and maybe share a word of encouragement to our homeschool families, um, mm. just in general, not necessarily about history, sure. but just from your heart as a homeschool mom and one who knows what um, all of us are going through? <laughs> sure. I do have something I want to share because I've been, um, I don't know, sifting through this even recently. I was talking to a homeschool mom who was trying to lay out all the plans for her homeschool and they had lots of good things that they had added to their plate and she was asking me my opinion and as I studied it something occurred to me is that her plate was a little too full and by adding too much to their what are we going to do this week she was cutting into those precious moments and those little bitty time slots you have where you get to the nitty gritty of homeschooling your children don't replace the best with just good. Don't forget that those little bitty sessions, that moment that you're sitting next to them talking about earthworms or digging for them in the backyard, don't neglect how valuable that is because you're working on communication skills, you're working on relationship, you're valuing who that student is and his giftedness. And yeah, there's squirming and there's bickering between the siblings and there's all sorts of chaos in some of those moments. I've lived through those moments of chaos, but in retrospect, it was that very chaos. It was me seeking to overcome the chaos and help them and, you know, find this learning atmosphere in our home. That is the hard work. That is what's valuable. So don't miss that. Don't farm them out too quick to all the good options that there are. And I'm not saying you don't have them in some outside classes for this or that, or a co-op for some other felt need, but don't squeeze, don't squeeze too much because the relationship at home, it's an extension of family and family is God's idea and his design. So that's just a caution I have for homeschool parents who are new or even veterans who all of a sudden have found themselves sucked into a lot. I've been there before and had to cut back. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. I appreciate that very much. I feel like sometimes even um, I'm down to only two. I started homeschooling six. Now I'm down to two. But even even now, as they're in high school, I feel like sometimes our focus is, well, we need to get the worksheets done, or we need to get this completed, or that quiz in, and that test. And I'm missing some of those moments, those learning, teaching moments that are so precious and really uh, create wonderful memories. So I thank you for that reminder. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Linda, and thank you for creating a homeschool resource that is just such, such a valuable tool for homeschool families. Thank you. I'm so glad it's resonated with your family, and I hope it does with many more, because in a way, I, I am just sort of like another homeschool mom who was living the nitty gritty. So I think that that has helped support the curriculum. I tried to give you what you can really do in a day. And then there's this passion for world history that I think your your people heard today <laughs> with all my little stories. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know what? It's it's when we speak from the passion in our heart that really we touch other people. So I appreciate you sharing that. I'd like to thank our listeners for joining us today. If you enjoyed this session, please subscribe or follow homeschool.com on your favorite platform for more informative homeschool discussions that inspire us as we are homeschooling and loving it. 